Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, share my screen and so uh, last week uh, we finished up uh, uh, real briefly talking about 5G and uh, I did talk about this uh, Alu Moody um, MIMO uh, technique a little bit and then um talked about it the uh, millimeter waves we're uh really focused on beam forming to try to get as much energy to the uh subscriber units the uh end user units as possible because energy is is really difficult to generate and to propagate at uh millimeter waves and stuff so we're really uh kind of beam forming or using directional antenna arrays to concentrate it, the energy uh and then just briefly mention that uh 5g does use uh error control coding um you know when we implement uh the channel coding error control coding in uh communication systems they're uh they tend to be uh complex and kind of a uh, a combination of both uh, block codes, linear block codes, and convolutional codes. And then um, uh, we try to correct code, uh, try to correct errors when we can. But if we uh, can't correct, then uh, we uh, can at least detect sometimes that there's an error and then we ask for uh it to be resent and uh we didn't really go into that that's kind of a more of a network layer uh type of uh thing when we ask for um uh symbols to be resent uh but yeah so uh just mentioning that these uh these codes exist so uh now let's uh dive in and uh kind of talk about cellular communications in general um you know i think uh by now you guys have all grown up with cell phones so um you're hopefully kind of familiar with uh the concept but um you know if we go back in time back before cellular communications we actually still had some level of mobile communications. Uh, you could, if you were um, uh, special enough and rich enough, you could get a radio telephone in your car. Uh, it basically took up half your trunk. And, uh, um, but um, uh, there was, it was very expensive because uh, basically what the telephone company would do would be to put up a big antenna on the a mountain or the tallest building in town and try to cover the whole city uh, with one transmitter. Uh, and so only uh, a few people could use it at a time because you're all trying to work on that one transmitter. Well, cellular, uh, the, the fundamental concept here is that we divide up that spatial dimension also. Right. So we we talked briefly about how we can, uh, you know, uh, use different parts of the radio spectrum to separate out users. And uh, you can have, um, you know, some people talking on one frequency and other people talking on another frequency. And you use some filters and you can kind of keep all those conversations isolated and uh, we're happy. Right. And uh, then we can also do it in time, and uh, we can do time division uh, uh, multiple access where um, one person can talk uh, and exchange maybe a few packets of data for a few uh, milliseconds, and then another uh, person will talk and another person, and, and you kind of do a, a round robin. And... Um, then everyone gets uh, a chance to speak. It's kind of like time sharing on a computer. Um, the the CPU uh, uh, gives a little bit of uh, attention to uh, different users, different programs, and uh, but it cycles around fast enough that no one really notices uh, that uh, they're not continually talking to uh, the the system. So. Uh, 
Um, and then we also talked about co-division multiple access. Well, uh, th these are different ways of kind of sharing the spectrum. Uh, but now we're looking at divvying up the spatial dimension. And uh, instead of uh, putting a big transmitter on a mountaintop or a building top that's cranking out hundreds and hundreds of watts and um, trying to cover a whole area, let's, um, let's build smaller systems, but... Um, uh, you know, many more of them and arrange them in such a way that they all have kind of uh, areas of responsibility spatially wise. And then we'll interconnect them uh, using a backhaul network, right? So uh, basically uh, uh, by using lower power and uh, but more uh, channels, now we can support more users all at a time. Uh, now, the, the big trade-off here is our um, uh, CapEx and, to an extent, our um, OpEx also. Uh, these are kind of uh, terms, uh, abbreviations that kind of blend between engineering and uh, uh, finance um, or economics. Uh, CapEx is your capital expenditure and OpEx is your operational expenditure. So. Uh, maybe you studied this in uh, in capstone project uh, uh, class. I don't know, but uh, capex uh, is you know the cost of building all those towers and building uh, all the equipment, buying all the equipment that goes on those towers and the antennas and um, you know uh, the carriers like uh, the Verizon's, T-Mobile's, AT and T's. They actually don't own. Uh, Towers that much anymore. It's uh, third parties uh, like Crown Castle and American Tower uh, Corporation own most of the towers in the U.S. And then they lease out space. So if you look at this tower behind me, let's say uh, I think this is from overseas, but uh, uh, oh, actually you can't see that, can you? Um, uh, because I'm sharing my screen. So um, yeah, if you if you look at this uh, tower here. You see that there's multiple antennas. This is not a cell phone tower, but it's the same type of concept. Uh, so maybe this tower is owned by uh, American Tower or Crown Castle. And then uh, you'll pay for uh, a lease, a monthly lease or a yearly lease on putting these uh, antennas up on the tower. And basically, uh, the higher up you go and the bigger antenna you have, the more you got to pay. And uh, the, the lower you are, the smaller antenna, the less you have to pay. So um, uh, let me share again. And um, uh, OK, so um, basically, you know, the more towers you're going to have, the more it's going to cost you. Uh, uh, we most towers uh, are sectorized, and so uh, you'll see uh, kind of three sets of antennas spaced around them, and uh, they broadcast uh, or communicate out into uh, sectors that are about 120 degrees um, in, in span. And so uh, instead of the antenna uh, radiating omnidirectionally uh, or in 360 degrees, it's focused. <laughs> And again, this helps us break up the uh, spatial dimension of uh, the spectrum so that more users can share it. Um, then there's this concept of a frequency reuse uh, pattern uh, to minimize intercell interference. So um, that an example here is this, uh, where uh, F1 would be one frequency, F2 would be another frequency, F3, uh, yet another frequency. Each one of these little hexagons is a uh, a cell, and actually the the towers are uh, typically at the vertices of these things. And so uh, this would uh, a tower here uh, would be radiating uh, at channel uh, according to F one out in this 120 degrees range here, right? Uh, these uh, this angle um, with this hexagon here. 
And, uh, you know, of course, your antenna pattern is not a hexagon. It's more of a kind of a, a lobe uh, out there. But uh, it's uh, trying to cover this region using F1. And in this direction, F7. In this direction, F6. And uh, then there'd be another tower that is at uh, one of these other vertices. And um, so uh, these... These things uh, then are um, uh, designed so that we are um, uh, it, you you have a minimal overlap of the same frequencies, right? So uh, if the tower is over here uh, talking on F one. The next F one is way over here, way down here, way over here, right? And so uh, hopefully, even though you know, we we can't design a, a propagation system or an antenna system where we say, all right, radiate your energy for uh, five miles and then stop and, and have no energy after that. It, that doesn't exist, right? So our energy uh, decays um, uh, with distance. And uh, so even way out here, there's still going to be some energy from this uh, cell over here. But um, uh, hopefully it's really low in power and uh, that this uh, base station here is going to have uh, uh, you know, enough energy to overcome the interference from these over here. So uh, this is an example of frequency reuse of seven. And this is a canonical one that we uh, tend to study. So um, in real life, uh, these cells are not so uniform in size and are not really hexagonal. Um, you, uh, uh, you know, there's engineers that go out there and uh, um, estimate the coverage of a given um, base station sector uh, and uh, try to decide how far it's propagating and, and where do you put antennas, where do you put towers to get uh, good coverage. Uh, so um, this is this is a highly idealized uh, view of things. All right. Um, now, when we move from one cell to another, when we're mobile, um, we need uh, an ability to kind of hand off from uh, one tower to another or one sector of a tower to another. We might uh, kind of be driving along or walking along or whatever, um, and we still might be close to a particular tower, but we're on kind of that borderline uh, of the sector, uh, sector boundaries, and so we're uh, needing to be handed off to that other sector, or we need to be handed off to a whole nother tower. Uh, and so the network, um, uh, the base station controllers and and uh, that type of thing are trying to manage uh, the user load on any given tower and uh, or the, the set of towers and uh, then uh, move a user's connection from one tower or sector to another um, when that's appropriate, right? So it's it's monitoring its um, uh, energy and um, uh, you know signal signal strength and the error rate and that type of thing uh, to be able to decide, hey, when is it time to switch from one tower to another? Um, we uh, tend to talk um, about a hard handoff where you're either talking to one or another and, and you switch and hopefully you don't drop. Um, uh, in the old days, we used to uh, have situations where all of a sudden you drop and uh, it was because of a failed handoff. Uh, those type of things don't happen as much anymore. But um, uh, you would only, in a hard handoff, you'd only be talking to one tower or another. Uh, in soft handoffs, uh, this was popular in uh, CDMA, type technology, uh, the code division multiple access uh, form of spread spectrum. And that was uh, uh, dominating in the US uh, for 3G uh, and uh, uh, 3G plus uh, uh, type systems. 
And there, uh, actually, we could be connected to multiple towers, let's say two towers at a time. And um, in the background, we would be combining uh, those uh, signals um, to be able to try to uh, improve or enhance uh, the signal strength. So, um, uh, and so if you're kind of on the border, you might actually be connected to uh, two towers at once. Uh, it's the base station that controls that handoff. So it's uh, instructing the handset to uh, start talking to a different uh, antenna that might require a frequency change. Um, and uh, like I say, you know, hopefully that's all done uh, transparently and you don't even know that it's happening. But uh, that type of uh, thing is happening in the background. And of course, the towers have to be able to talk to each other to manage that. So uh, if you're have an ongoing communication with one tower and you're being handed off to the other tower, that other tower needs to know uh, that you're authorized, that you have an existing connection with maybe a, another handset uh, or a, a, a phone on a regular um, telephone network and you're uh, in the middle of a voice call and that connection needs to be maintained, uh, that you're authorized uh, to use that system and that uh, you're being properly billed. Um, and stuff. So there's a lot uh, going on in the background. And again, that's at a, a higher level than we're studying in this course. We're really focused on that, what we call the physical uh, layer or the, uh, uh, the, the RF uh, modulations, the radio access network uh, uh, type of thing. But uh, all these uh, processes are going on higher in the network stack. All right, and so uh, there's not only connections between towers to facilitate all this, but there's obviously needs to be a connection to uh, the rest of the telephone network uh, the, um, um, and also the Internet. So uh, um, that could be a fiber line running from the tower uh, to the uh, telephone uh, company's network switch. Uh, which would be in a big building somewhere, or um, uh, could be wireless in very uh, remote uh, locations where it's not economical to run fiber to. And so you could have a point-to-point a, a -point, um, microwave, uh, millimeter wave type of uh, um, a communication backhaul. And that uh, the whether fiber or wireless, it's handling all the traffic, right? So it's aggregating. Uh, if you've got you know a hundred different users connected to a tower uh, at you know three different sectors and uh, that particular tower, then it's aggregating all of their uh, data and communications and sending it on to uh, um, a network access point. So. Um, once we start talking about cellular systems, then we have this concept uh, that we call the RAN or the radio access network. And uh, this is uh, the, the systems that we've been talking about in this course, right? The implementation of all the theory and, and techniques that we've been talking about. So uh, this would include the uh, amplifiers and oscillators and, and that RF hardware, but also all the uh, FPGAs and DSPs and, and CPUs that are um, forming up all of these uh, um, um, uh, baseband signals, right? So, and when you think of that OFDM type of um, waveform that we uh, study uh, over the last few sessions, then we know that there's uh, not only some uh, quadrature uh, amplitude modulation processes going on, but there's uh, inverse Fourier transforms and serial uh, parallel parallel serial uh, type of uh, conversions and all, uh, along with all the error control coding, the perturbi decoding, all of that. Uh, that's all part of the rant. Now, uh, we it, with 5G in particular, we've uh, started talking about a split RAM. 
in in 4G, we might have put some of the radio electronics on the tower right next to the antenna and some of the electronics at a shelter in a shelter at the base of the antenna. And then we have fiber um, running up and down the, the tower uh, carrying digitized uh, packets of information. And uh, now we've kind of expanded that so that we might have uh, a, a, a very more, more complex split RAN type of situation. So some of this processing, it might be happening at kind of a, a centralized, but still kind of edge uh, server location, probably not a, a, uh, a like a AWS cloud type of thing, but um, more of an edge server that um, might be kind of regionally or uh, metro located. And then uh, you would have some distributed unit Maybe that's at the tower base, or maybe that's up at the tower also. And then the actual RF hardware uh, on the tower itself. So uh, this is a description of, uh, or kind of illustration of the different functionalities that are happening that uh, kind of make up the split RAN concept. And uh, so you've got on the downlink uh, side where you're you're uh, starting from the base station antenna and talking or transmitting to the subscriber units, the mobile units. Then uh, you've got uh, all these different uh, uh, things going on here: um, the radio resource control, the uh, packet data convergence protocol, uh, just trying to make things uh, efficient. Uh, the radio link control, um, kind of both a high level and a, a, a higher layer and a lower layer uh, implementations of this Mac is your media access uh, control. That's kind of deciding who gets to speak when. And uh, so we don't uh, both, you know, everyone try to talk at once. Uh, it's kind of a simplistic way of thinking about it. And then uh, finally, the physical layer. And this is, again, where uh, most of what we've been looking at is concentrated. And so uh, and then you've got this kind of um, uplink process from the um, subscriber units to the base station. And uh, the data is uh, coming in here. And um, so any of these locations or options to be able to kind of split and say, all right, everything to the right of that's going to be at the antenna and everything to the left of that's going to be at some edge edge server. Um, so uh, one example is the 7.2 split RAM. Uh, this is promoted by the Open RAM Alliance. Uh, a number of companies are uh, supportive of this. Uh, kind of the alternative is to have a proprietary or semi-proprietary system. Some vendors claim that they're open, but then uh, add in so many enhancements and options that um, it's not really all that open. But um, uh, for an example, the one that I've worked with a little bit is the NVIDIA Aerial uh, system. That's uh, an edge processing system that is uh, kind of uh, doing a lot of the baseband processing using uh, CUDA and on running on their uh, GPUs. Uh, NVIDIA has uh, a, a CUBB for the baseband uh, waveform uh, processing and uh, which would be all the IFFTs and all that top thing. And then uh, uh, CU VNF, uh, virtualized network functions. We didn't really talk about that, we won't, uh, but that, that's kind of a higher layer uh, type of thing that's available in, um, uh, in 5G, but it's basically uh, uh, different ways of managing the network routing and, and that type of thing. Um, so uh, we're, uh, achieving all of this using kind of time triggered networking uh, because this becomes very time sensitive. Uh, if uh, you're trying to uh, do some of this modulation and coding and, 
and that type of thing, then all this type of stuff needs to uh, be done very um, uh, accurately in, in, in time. So uh, just an example. So, uh, you know, not worried about you memorizing any of this uh, type of thing, just kind of understanding the concept that uh, uh, you have a split RAN type of uh, system. This would be the RU. Actually, in this case, the uh, FFTs are, are being done at the, the radio unit. And this is a distributed unit, and this is a centralized unit. So, um, and this F1 is describing an interface, a uh, standardized interface, uh, again, it would be fiber with packets uh, running back and forth uh, between these and uh, and also. Um, all right, so let me, uh, so that uh, kind of wraps up our cellular uh, uh, and 5G type of things, except uh, now we can talk a little bit about uh, standardization uh, process, and we'll uh, use a little bit of 5G as an example there also as we go through this. So uh, real quick, we'll talk about uh, standards. Um, uh, they're standards organizations. Uh, and when I was writing up, I was realizing, you know, there's a lot of advocacy organizations too, and it'd be good for you to be familiar with some of those. And then uh, if we have time, we'll talk about uh, research trends that I just selected a few that are that are interesting. There's always tons and tons of different research going on, but um, standards again. Uh, this is this is something that uh, uh, ABET likes us to uh, promote. Uh, ABET is our uh, uh, the accreditation agency that accredits uh, engineering education uh, programs, and uh, one of the things that they um, uh, emphasize are a standards driven design process and that makes a lot of sense uh, it's good that we're educating uh, our students of this uh, concept so uh what do standards do well uh, the main thing they do is they promote compatibility and um so uh, you know the classic example that i use is that you um you buy a um a set of uh bluetooth earbuds or um um, uh, you know, headset or something like that, and or a Bluetooth mouse. And uh, now, because there is a Bluetooth standard, now you can be assured that that uh, those earbuds, uh, those handsets, uh, headsets, the uh, the mouse are going to work with uh, whatever laptop or uh, cell phone that you have, uh, whatever you're connecting them to. Right, and that's um, uh, achieved by uh, groups, you know, different constituents getting together and developing a standard, and then uh, uh, we build to those standards and we test to those standards, and then um, uh, and make sure that there's uh, there's compatibility. Uh, the focus tends to be on the transmitter because the transmitter is the one that forms up the waveform. And uh, uh, all the the interactions that uh, go on and that type of thing, and so um, the standards tend to be written from that perspective. There's obviously some uh, things that a receiver needs to do in order to communicate with the transmitter. It's got to uh, send back information. Well, when it's sending back information, it's really transmitting, right? So um, uh, the that leaves the uh, the opportunity for different companies to kind of compete over uh, uh, superior received type technology, but still ensure compatibility with the waveform. Um, the standards processes, uh, uh, there's a, a tends to be a bit of a tension because, um, you know, ideally we want uh, a nice set of diverse participants, and we want the best ideas to come to the surface with the best technology and that type of thing. Um, there tends to be some competition. If uh, you've come up with a great idea uh, and uh, you have a lot of intellectual property, maybe some patents associated with that, well, you might try to get those into the standard uh, so that everyone has to pay you a, a licensing fee or um, because you have so much expertise in that area, you think you'll be in a better competitive situation. 
Uh, so there, there tends to be a little bit of a, uh, competition in that, but, uh, yeah, generally we want, uh, uh, our standards to be globalized, um, because that way we get our greatest economies of scale. Um, so that when we're building hardware or even developing software stacks that, uh, the cost of that development is, uh, divvied up, uh, amongst, you know, eight, uh, seven, eight billion people, however many people we have on earth now. So, um, these standards tend to take several years to develop and, um, even in, uh, something like, uh, uh, 5G, uh, when we move from 4G to 5G and, and then different iterations of, of 5G, um, we're, we're not starting from scratch, but uh, it still takes uh, several years to get a new release out, typically. Um, and these involve different proposals uh, from different uh, stakeholders that uh, might want their technology in there or might think that this is uh, the, the better way. Uh, uh, tends to start with identifying the use cases that are going to be important in the next generation of the technology. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, again, I'll, I'll kind of lean on uh, cellular communications, uh, you know, as we're uh, uh, implementing 5G and rolling out that technology, uh, there's already folks looking at 6G and trying to predict what are the big uh, uh, changes in our economy and our ecosystem of how we use wireless communications uh, that are happening now or, or we think might happen in the next uh, 10 years or so. And uh, what, what needs to uh, be enhanced uh, in the next generation in order to meet those things, right? So um, you go through a bunch of uh, simulations and maybe uh, you, you know, you have some patents once that standard uh, gets in. Patents are really separate from uh, standards, but uh, if there is, uh, you know, a typical standard, let's say, might um, uh, involve or rely upon uh, different uh, patents from a whole bunch of different stakeholders. Uh, what's often done is that then uh, everyone that holds patents gets into this patent pool. And for every uh, then system that gets sold, part of that price is a royalty that then gets divvied up uh, into that patent pool and the, uh, the people that are, are participating in that. Um, so I just listed uh, three, and there's there's links in this. So if you download these, uh, you have the PowerPoint or PDF from uh, Moodle, you should be able uh, to to click through on these uh, different uh, people here. So uh, actually, let me uh, hop to uh, uh, some of these. So uh, 3GPP is uh, the one that handles and. I think I have too many tabs open and my computer starting to slow down. So hopefully uh, this is coming across okay. But um, uh, 3GPP is uh, the global standards organization that uh, manages uh, our, you know, 3G, 4G, now 5G, and eventually 6G type uh, communication, uh, communication standards. And so um, if we look at all these uh, different specifications, uh, we've got release 18, which is still 5G, but uh, uh, kind of being worked on, it's, it's more of an advanced type of thing. Uh, 17, I think, is uh, what our current latest uh, approved uh, release is, if I, uh, I don't remember correctly. And uh, so you've got all these releases way back. Um, you've got different... Uh, groups, uh, of course, uh, uh, to get a, a cell phone standard to work, uh, we've got to uh, deal with not just the physical uh, layer, but uh, uh, lots and lots of different uh, layers, including um, a roaming, uh, international roaming, and billing, and authorization, and security, and and uh, um, you know how do we connect different base stations, uh, how do we connect to the uh, 
uh, the network, how do we manage all these things and that type of thing. So you'll see that there's a core network and, and terminals uh, set of working groups. There's radio access networks, RANs, and there's a whole bunch of different working groups there and uh, services and, and system aspects and, and so on. So um, IEEE has, is also a major standards organization. They do lots and lots of different standards. Uh, but uh, they are um, uh, uh, they they are active in a number of different uh, communication uh, wireless communications uh, networks, and uh, they uh, on this uh, page here. So there's a whole subdivision of IEEE that's a standards association. They have a very very well defined. Uh, standards process that uh, actually anyone can participate in. Um, and then uh, Bluetooth is another example. And uh, here's uh, their uh, course specifications and stuff. So uh, let me switch back to my um, presentation here. And uh, IEEE 802 is uh, a family of different uh, specifications that are wireless in nature and ones that uh, you're familiar with to a degree at least, right? 802.11 is uh, also branded as Wi-Fi, as an industry branded uh, type term. And uh, But the um, standards uh, associated with that are done by the IEEE uh, as uh, 802.11 and the wireless local area networks. Um, also, uh, 802.15 is a family of uh, specifications that are focused on personal area networks. Uh, in this case, that uh, covers um, what Zigbee uses uh, and a lot of your home networking, smart home network uh, type systems use as their lower levels, right? Uh, lower layers, the um, uh, physical uh, layer and the media access layer. Uh, um, and also uh, 802.16 uh, was uh, popular for a while before LTE was released and kind of uh, took over. Uh, this was known as the, uh, in the industry name is uh, WiMAX, uh, but very similar to LTE. Um, there's a few others that are uh, interesting. Uh, uh, this is just the 802 series. There's lots and lots of other IEEE standards, but these are the ones that are uh, focused on uh, wireless. And you can actually uh, download those standards for free. Uh, from the IEEE GET program, uh, which uh, they've been uh, subsidized by uh, companies that want to sponsor an open access to these standards. Otherwise, uh, for IEEE in particular, you've got to pay uh, money to buy uh, those uh, standards, uh, even if you're a member. Uh, IEEE likes to get your money one way or another. So, all right, we'll jump to the next uh, Zoom session. So I'll see you on the other side.